Hi everyone and welcome to another Be My App webinar. We'll be starting very remotely. Again, we'll be starting very shortly. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another Be My webinar. Once again, I'm Fernando, and it's a pleasure having all of you here. And this webinar issue, we actually have Can't See Dogs, PayPal full stack JavaScript engineer. And he's going to be showing us how to actually manipulate AST and a little bit more information about it. So I'm going to let the man of the hour do the introduction. And without further ado, Kent, you have the mic. All right, cool. Everybody see me? Yes, sir. Okay, cool. Let me uh, just going to uh, move this out of the way. Sorry. And I'll share my screen. All right. So I'm going to move that out of the way too. Uh, just for everyone tuning in, if you have any questions, be sure to type them in the comment section because at the end, uh, Kent will actually be answering your questions. So, Kent, please continue. Yeah, sweet. Um, so, yeah, and I've got the YouTube video up. So, I will see them. Um, cool. Is the it doesn't look like it's showing my screen. Do you need to focus on my screen or something? Uh, actually, we see your screen. We see the oh. slides. Okay. Cool. Sweet. So yeah, this is a um, beginner's guide to ASTs. Uh, transform your code like Optimus Prime. So um, yeah, this is just a bunch of information about me. I'm not gonna like go through it all. Just my slides are right there. Beginner AST slides. Um, and uh, yeah, you can, like all these things are linked. So if you want to know what those things are, then that's a good place to find out. Um, so I like to start out my talks with expectations. So um, yeah, just so that you know what to expect, you can stop this video if it's not what you're looking for. Uh, so I'm not gonna be talking, uh, like giving a deep dive to parsing, tokenizing, and lexing. Uh, James Kyle gave a fantastic talk at EmberConf recently about how parsers uh, work, and it's super, super cool. You could check it out, um, but that's not what this talk is going to be about. Um, it's also not everything you need to know to be productive with ASTs. Um, just this is kind of a beginner's guide. So it'll be a basic introduction to the concept of ASTs, why they matter, um, how they work. And um, I'll give a sort of practical demo of how uh, to use them with Babel and ESLint. And when I say sort of practical, it's basically not practical at all. Um, at least the Babel plugin isn't very practical. The ESLint plugin is really useful, except a uh, plugin already exists. Um, so this is mostly instructional. Um, and yeah, hopefully this gets you totally psyched about ASTs. So great, yeah, let's get started. Um, so I think it's important to start out with why uh, this even matters, uh, why you should care. So um, 
here are a couple of things about why the abstract syntax tree, or AST, is really cool. Uh, first is that Babel uses um, an AST to transpile your ESNext code, or ES6, ES7, or like ES2016 and forward, uh, stage two features and stuff, uh, transforms it into uh, code that works in the browser today. I made up this term ES now. I think, yeah. These aren't really super common terms, but that's what I'm calling it. So um, yeah, to transform in code from one thing to another. And it's not just about um, future features either. It's also um, can transform all kinds of things. And so here are a couple of uh, just a few of my favorite plugins. This is the Babel plugin Lodash, which basically, um, if if you're familiar with how bundlers work and, and everything, if uh, you know you want to minimize how much stuff you're sending to the browser. And so um, you could write all of your code like this um, so that here it's only going to get the, the map function from Lodash or the add function from Lodash FP. And so you're not loading the entire Lodash in your project, just the pieces you need. But writing your import statements like this is a real pain in the rear. And so um, instead, you can use this Babel plugin and write your import statements like this and the Babel plugin will update it for you automatically. It's very cool. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's one of my favorite plugins. Um, it just like makes a lot, it, it optimizes for you, so you don't have to make your code harder to maintain uh, to be optimized. Uh, another cool thing, Babel plugin module alias. This is uh, one of my very favorites also. And so I'm sure we've all seen stuff like this, where you have to go dot, 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 all the way up to like your root directory to find your utils and whatever. This um, actually lets you write your import statements like this, um, where you give an alias to a directory. And it will, um, before like any of these imports run or the require statements run, it will update it to um, what it actually should be um, so that you can move this file around and not have to update all the import statements. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing this for like a ton of stuff, but for like root level things, utils, modules, and stuff, um, this is really, really handy. And then uh, uh, another favorite of mine, uh, Babel plugin transform React remove prop types. So some of these can get kind of long, but basically, if you're familiar with React, you have these prop types that save you so much headache, um, but the, it's just dead weight in production because you you should be turning off that uh, type checking. Uh, or that runtime type checking in production. And so what this plugin does is it uh, takes all of your React components, finds the prop types, and strips them. And so um, you don't have the extra weight of the bytes, and you also don't have the extra weight of um, like processing uh, the creation of this object and anything like that. But again, this is another instance where um, the plugin, the tool, optimizes your code for you. So you can continue making your uh, code as readable as ever. Um, but you don't have to worry about um, optimizing anything at all. It's um, it's just kind of magically happens for you. So it's super cool. Um, and then at linting, ESLint uses ASTs to lint your code. Um, and I'm only going to show one of my very favorite plugins. There are tons of rules and plugins that ESLint provides. Uh, one of my favorites is the ESLint plugin import. Um, and, and this comes with a whole bunch of useful things. Um, but one of the coolest is it will tell you um, when it, um, you're trying to import something that actually can't be imported because that file doesn't exist. Um, this happens all the time. The get logger um, module is actually in the same directory, so that dot should be removed. Um, but uh, you don't normally find that out until runtime or bundle time. And uh, having something integrated in your editor is really, really nice. Um, and it'll also tell you if you're trying to import a default when this module isn't exporting a default, or if you're trying to pull out a named um, export, then uh, it'll tell you, hey, that thing's not exporting anything by that name. All kinds of really cool things. And it actually integrates really well with Webpack um, as well. So if you're using special stuff from Webpack, um, importing like CSS and stuff, then um, you can uh, get that. And it also works for uh, require statements, I believe, as well. So. Really cool stuff. Um, oh, I forgot to refresh my browser. This should say, uh, <laughs> that's kind of embarrassing. Um, this should say JS Code Shift, um, or yeah, Code Mods with JS Code Shift. So um, I don't have any, they don't have a cool logo, unfortunately. But um, 
code mods are super, super cool. So basically, what it um, uh, this is like Babel, but for one-time transformations. And so you take code, uh, like the, the React community uses this a lot. So when React pushes a breaking change, um, the Facebook uses React a ton. Obviously, they have 20,000 components is the last number I heard. And uh, yeah, that's that's a lot. So um, what what they do when they need to make a breaking change, they can't go through every single one of their components and update it. Like That's just too many. And so um, they take their entire code base of, of components, and they uh, run it through what's called a code mod, which will um, generate an AST off of each um, uh, for each module and make some transformations to that AST and then spit out um, the, the new code. And so those transformations are things to account for API uh, breaking API changes and that kind of thing. So super, super practical. Um, and and then they open source their uh, their code bonds so that other people can upgrade uh, painlessly as well. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the why of ASTs. They're awesome. So um, yeah, what, what even is this thing? What does this thing look like? Um, so we're going to go ahead and take a look at, oh, whoops, shoot. My apologies, these are out of order. So I'm going to go backwards. OK, <laughs> sorry. So um, yeah, code for humans. This is So we write our code so that humans can understand it um, because like, we're going to be maintaining this in the long term. So we use uh, variable names, and um, we call functions with um, useful names. So here we have this random. Um, and so all of this text is useful for humans to understand it. Um, but it's like the computer doesn't really care what these variable names are. It's just like all that really matters is that unique random array is um, named what it's used uh, as it's used. That's all that really matters. This could be called A for uh, all the computer cares. So what the computer does when it sees your um, when it sees your code is it generates an AST. So this is your first look, maybe for uh, some of you. This is a look at an AST. It's kind of crazy. It's kind of huge. Um, but this describes our program. So here we have a file, and that inside of that file, it, there's a program. That program has a body. You probably can't see this very well. We're going to get a better look at this later. Um, but uh, yeah, it's basically a giant JSON object that represents um, your program, um, that represents your code. And what's cool about this is it can then be manipulated um, and uh, changed so that um, people can. Um, uh, like you can generate new code off of it. So the Babel plugins uh, will take this AST, make some changes to it, like maybe change this uh, variable declaration to an import statement or something like that. Um, and, uh, and then it'll uh, take the resulting AST after all those transformations and spit out code. So that's what the AST represented as a JSON object. So here we're going to make it a little bit more consumable for us. And we're going to look at a tool right now um, to kind of visualize what this actually looks like. So uh, this is from JointJS. They actually created this really cool tool. They created it to show off their, uh, their graph thing here. But uh, we're going to use it um, in part for the graph, but also for the fact that what they're representing is, a, is an AST. So pretty cool. So here we have uh, this code. I'm going to bump that up a little bit, um, where we specify a variable called a, and uh, give it the value 42. And then another variable, b, give it 5. Then we have this function declaration uh, that has a body where we're returning a plus d. Uh, d is a parameter. And then variable c um, is an expression of those two uh, together. So let's look at what the AST looks like from this. So if, if we think about it, we, we have our program. That's all of the code. And then uh, the body of our program is each one of these things. And so if we look at our AST, we see that represented. We have a program. And then this, what we see here, is the body. And so a uh, program has a couple children. Uh, these are children inside the body. The first is the variable declaration that we see, the variable a equals 42. That variable declaration, uh, this is called a node. In fact, each one of these is called a node. And this variable declaration node, um, has a property on it called a variable declarator. Um, and, and incidentally, the variable declarator property 
um, is actually an array, and you can have multiple variable declarators. In this case, we have a single one, and uh, the identifier is A, and the literal is 42, so the literal that it's being assigned to. Um, but if we wanted to, we, we see we have the same thing for B equals 5. We could actually combine these variable declarations um, into a single one. If you um, are familiar, you can actually get rid of that second uh, var declaration and just combine these as a single line. I don't recommend doing this because it, um, it's not, in my opinion, a very good practice. But for sure, AST, now we only have three children here because we see one variable, two variable function, so three children. Um, that variable declaration now is var a 42 and b is 5. And um, it has two children now, two variable declarators. And uh, that's the a and the b. Um, and yeah, and then we have our function. And that function declaration has a block statement. That's the body of the function. And that block statement has uh, just a return statement in there. But uh, let's go ahead and uh, change it up a little bit. We'll say const result equals that, and then return a result and show that AST. So now this block statement actually has two children, uh, two child nodes, a variable declaration, and a return statement. Uh, and so our variable declaration has a single declarator. If you remember from this variable de declaration, they can have two, but this one has only one. And on the left side, the identifier for that variable declaration is the result. And um, the, uh, on the right side of that variable declaration is a binary expression. Um, and that binary expression is a plus d. And so, so on and so forth. And we also have call expressions. I'm not going to take you through like every single node type that there is, because there are many. Um, but hopefully, this kind of gives you an idea of like the concept of an abstract syntax tree really being a tree of nodes that compose together to create a program. Hopefully, that all makes sense. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and explore uh, the AST a little bit differently now with the AST Explorer. So this thing's pretty cool. Um, it's uh, actually, I, I am understating that. This thing is totally amazing. Um, and basically, on the left here, we have our code. And on the right, we have um, the generated AST. So we're not going to look at this code. I'm going to actually show you um, how to use this um, with a couple of links. So we'll explore the AST with our own code. And uh, this code is actually mostly copy pasted from transformer names, the transformer names module, which I actually created for this presentation. So fun stuff. Uh, basically, the purpose of the module is to give you a random transformer name um, whenever you call the random function. So pretty fun stuff. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and explore this AST a little bit. I'm going to slide this over a little and make it even bigger so you can see. So here we have. Uh, the root of the entire thing is the file. And um, as a child node of that is a program. And then it has a couple other like metadata information that we're going to just kind of skip over. Um, but here in our program, um, we can see the program has a body. And that's all of these things together. That body is an array of other nodes. So these are the children of the program. And then we have a variable declaration. That's our first thing up here is this require for unique random array. We're declaring it as a const uh, uh, declaration type. Um, and it has an identifier called unique random array. And you'll see, if you look over on the left, as I'm hovering over things, um, everything's getting highlighted. So you can see what part of the program is associated with that. Also, as I click around here, um, it will update um, what is being shown on the right. So I can click around and see unique random array. That is a string literal. If I um, click on um, the require statement, that is an identifier. And that identifier is the callee for this call expression. So the entire statement here, which I can't actually like click on and highlight, but I can highlight right here. Um, so the call expression has a callee. It has arguments. 
Um, so all of these, lots of these terms are like terms that you should be familiar with programming day to day. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just given a formal name. And I actually really like using the AST Explorer to learn about new features that I haven't seen yet or, or I'm not as familiar with. Um, if I see in some open source code or something that somebody's using a feature I'm not uh, like I'm not used to or, or using it in a way that I haven't seen before, uh, then I'll just paste the code in here and look at the AST and, and get the names for things. So now I can like Google for that. Um, pretty handy stuff. So yeah, we have um, our variable declaration. That's one part of our body. We have a couple more of those uh, variable declarations. We also have this expression statement where I'm doing an assignment expression assigning um, on the left side um, the uh, value of module, sorry, the object property of module.exports. And then on the right side of this assignment expression um, is an object expression. And the right side could be an object expression. It could be a um, call expression. It could be a literal, it could be all kinds of things. Um, and in this case, it's an object expression that has uh, properties. Um, object expressions have properties that are object properties, and uh, they each have a key and a value. Um, and these, in this case, they're identifiers, but they could be binary expressions or wh whatever. So we could say like foo uh, one plus um, random three. So then if we look at what that uh, results in, um, do. We have another object property with an identifier on the left being the uh, foo identifier, and then the value in this case being a binary expression. If you remember from the last one, the value was just an identifier. So we have the binary expression where, whoops, where did my stuff go? Yeah, binary expression where the left is a numeric literal and the right is a call expression. So hopefully, like, hopefully this is starting to get a little bit boring um, because it, it, it really, um, um, like, w once you kind of understand that it's more of a, um, like, composing these nodes together to make a full program, then it becomes uh, a little bit simpler, and you're able to kind of intuitively understand what, what's going on in this AST. So I'm going to go ahead and um, move on to actually manipulating this AST and transforming it to do, uh, do something useful. So let's go ahead and do that. So we have the, the same code on the left, um, upper left here that we had before. All that we've done now is I turned on this transform here um, using Babel version 6. Um, oh, and I, I forgot to kind of explain a little bit more about how this tool works. So the AST Explorer um, has the ability to explore ASTs for several different uh, things. I don't even know what web IDL is, but I'm sure it's really interesting. Um, but we're, we're parsing JavaScript here. And then you have a whole bunch of options for um, the parsers that you use to like, generate the AST. And then you can uh, provide a bunch of settings for that too, uh, for the particular parser you've chosen. And then you can transform it. And, and we can choose, based on um, what we've selected here, we can choose what we're going to use to transform it. We're going to use Babel version 6, because that's the, um, like the current version of Babel. And when you do that, it pops open this um, uh, stuff on the bottom that I've already pre-filled with a lot of stuff. Um, but uh, on, the, on the bottom left, transform that we're going to write. And on the bottom right is um, the resulting code. And so actually, if we go to astexplore.net and just um, pop that open, it, it gives us a default transform that simply uh, takes identifiers and reverses them. So the tips is now spit and uh, spit nerp, um, yeah, is print tips, which is kind of fun. So we're going to transform our code in a much more useful way. What we're going to do is we're going to find each one of these identifiers and rename them as transformer character names. So um, all the code that I have in here is a little bit irrelevant, basically is like inlining the um, transformers names um, module. And so, um, whoops, that should be transformers names. Uh, so I, I get this function get random transformers names, uh, and that will give me, here, we'll just do name, and that will just give me a single 
uh, random transformer. So if I console.log that, I'll open my console and do get the console. Now uh, we got uh, power glide there. So that is basically all that all that we see here. The important part that I want you to pay attention to is uh, what we're exporting here. So this is a Babel plugin. All those plugins that I showed you before, the uh, Lodash plugin and the um, the module alias plugin, all of that stuff is just a file that is exporting a function. Um, it accepts an argument um, that has a, a whole bunch of utility functions on it that we can use. Uh, we're not actually going to be using any of these for our simple plugin, um, but uh, there's a fantastic Babel handbook that I recommend you check out uh, to learn about how to do these uh, transformations yourself. So um, yeah, we have this, um, this function that we're exporting. And as part of the Babel API, what it's expecting you to do is return an object that has a couple properties on it. Uh, we're only going to be uh, specifying the visitor property. So this, is, this uh, property is an object that is using what's called the visitor pattern. Let me explain what this is. So um, uh, like I've got this AST, and it's super cool, um, but it's really big for even a, a small program like this. And if I wanted to go find all of the identifiers to change them to uh, a random transformer name, then I would have a little bit of a hard time because identifiers can be found all kinds of places. I can find them inside of these um, object properties, inside of an object expression. I can find them um, inside of a, the identifier for a variable declaration or inside of uh, as an identifier in a binary expression um, or the update expression. Like You can find identifiers all over the place. And so what, uh, what finding these different nodes, uh, what, what that's called is uh, traversing the AST. And traversing the AST is not trivial. Um, and so the Babel plugin uh, does all the traversal for you, or, or sorry, the Babel plugin API does the traversal for you, and you just tell it what nodes you're interested in transforming. Um, and so basically what, what that allows you to do is, um, Sorry, one second. AST just totally uh, lost something. So yeah, what, what that allows you to do is uh, not have to worry about traversing the, the tree yourself, and, and you can leave that to, uh, to Babel. So we're going to go ahead and write our, um, our plugin using this visitor pattern. Basically, what you do in this object is you specify the um, the type of node that you're interested in visiting. So we're, we're interested in renaming all identifiers. And so that's the type of node that we're interested in. So if I just click on the, the nodes that I'm interested in transforming, I can see those are all identifiers. And I can take this node type and just paste it in as a property here. The value of this property will be a function. And that function will accept an argument called path. Now this path, let's go ahead and console.log the path. And here we get a ton of node paths printed out. Each one of these uh, represents the node path for each identifier in our program. So if I were to um, go ahead and remove all that, I'm going to get um, two node paths printed out because we have the unique random array and the require statement. So I get a bunch of these. And I can open these up and see a whole bunch of properties on this. Um, we're going to use two of these. Uh, one of them is node, and that is the actual node that this um, identifier is, um, like where this identifier was found in the tree. Um, and it also has parent, so the parent node. Um, and we're not going to use that one right now, but that one is used quite frequently. Um, parent path is also used, um, but we'll also use scope. What scope represents is the scope in which the identifier is found. So this transformer's names is inside the scope of the entire program. So it's in the scope of this uh, function closure. Um, but uh, for the uh, random items, uh, for example, the scope is not the entire program. So the, uh, the scope just includes this, uh, this closure. And, and because it's a const, it's actually block scoped. And so it's only inside of this else statement. Uh, so that's pretty 
pretty nifty, pretty interesting. Uh, now we know what this path thing is all about. We can start manipulating the node uh, to accomplish our purposes. So um, let's go ahead and we'll just say uh, const transformers or transformer name equals get random transformers name. We'll console log transformer. Oops. So then we see we get a whole bunch of random transformer names. So that's cool. Uh, now what we're going to do is um, we'll uh, go ahead and say path.node, because that's the node we're interested in. Uh, here, let's go ahead and actually we'll console log that so we know which property we want to change. We have a node, and it has a name, number. Uh, up here at the top, we have the name unique random array. So let's just kind of do this naively. We'll say path.node uh, dot name equals transformer name. Now we can see we've uh, changed all of the names for every one of our um, uh, our identifiers. So that's cool, but we have a couple of problems here. First, um, we have this unique random array identifier here that we've re renamed to Lightspeed, but it's being used right here, and uh, that's being that's now called uh, Wind Charger, and uh, that's a problem because this program no longer will run. And so what we need to do is make sure that we somehow track. Uh, that the the names are like being changed that like whatever is that node is representing is actually it's being changed everywhere and uh, that would be really difficult to do so um, or it just would be a headache and so um, the Babel plugin API um, allows for us to or, or gives us a utility to uh, do renaming of um, of identifiers and that is using the path.scope object. So if we console log path.scope, and we can see the scope for every one of our identifiers. And um, yeah, it gives us a whole bunch of, um, yeah, like a ton of utility functions. I've not used most of these. I, I think I've pretty much only used one of these. And I'm looking for it now. It is rename right there. So we're going to use path.scope.rename. And the API to this will take the original name. So we'll say path.node.name and the new name, transformer name. And now slingshot is slingshot here. Uh, the require statements are left alone um, because I guess encoded in the um, in this API is we don't want to mess with common JS, which is kind of nice. It didn't always, it wasn't always that way. Um, and then we have um, also, on like on object identifiers, it also isn't going to rename those because it knows that this object is being exported, and so other um, modules could potentially use those. So it's handling that for us as well. Um, and then we have Omega Supreme and Menasaur, and um, yeah, everything is a transformer name. So hooray! We have built our first totally useless Babel plugin. Um, so the, the inspiration for this kind of came from um, um, Sebastian McKenzie, who created Babel, uh, originally called 6 to 5. And in a JSConf talk, he actually um, made a transform that was similar to this, except instead of transformer names, it was emoji uh, and random combinations of emoji. And he took the entire jQuery source and he transformed it uh, to use emoji for all its identifiers. And that was pretty hilarious and awesome. You should check out that talk. Um, cool. So yeah, this is the visitor pattern. Um, we're visiting a single node uh, or, or a single node type called identifier. We're taking the path um, that our function is getting called with. And we're using the scope property to rename all variables or all identifiers with um, that name, uh, with the name of our node in that scope to a random um, uh, transformer name. So fun stuff. Um, great. So let's go ahead and um, we'll just leave that as it is. You can check it um, out the complete example here. And we'll go to the ESLint plugin um, now. So um, and unfortunately, I don't think I'll have time to show you a, a JS code shift example. Um, yeah, maybe maybe I'll have time to show an example, but not time to write one. Um, so yeah, here we have. 
uh, let's just go ahead and explore this code here. We, we have two if statements here. Uh, if something is greater than 3, then we're going to console log something is greater than 3. And then less than 3, something is less than 3. So pretty like basic program. Um, but uh, what we're going to, uh, what we do with ESLint is, is we don't transform code or anything. We, we're linting code. And so we're looking for practices that aren't um, optimal for one reason or another. And um, here, w the practice that we're going to be linting for is um, having no block statement for an if statement. And so if we look at the difference between these two if statements, we have the curly braces here. What that's called in um, AST language is it's called a block statement. Um, if we look at the if statement up here and see the do, 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 go up and up and up, where is this? We'll go to the if statement. Um, we have a test and a consequent. So the consequent on this one is an expression statement. Um, and as we saw, the consequent on this one is a block statement. So basically, what we want to do is ensure that all consequents for if statements are block statements. Otherwise, um, somebody could come in here. And if, if you add a new line to this, this also works just fine. But if you console.log and it uh, is awesome, you know, it, it could be really easy to think that um, this console log will only happen when this if statement uh, resolves to true. But that's not what's going to happen, uh, because um, if you don't have a block statement, it only runs the next line. It doesn't run um, anymore. So what, what actually will happen effectively is this will uh, be that. Uh, that's like the equivalent. And so it's better to put all of your if statements inside of a block so that when people come around to add stuff, they can see clearly whether they're going to be inside the if statement or not. So that's what we're going to be linting for in our ESLint plugin. Um, so let's um, uh, let's take a look at the the transform here. So what we're well, let's see, can I? Nope. So uh, things are a little bit different for ESLint. Uh, you can't use, um, like out of the box, you can't use ES6 in ES, uh, ESLint plugins. And so uh, that's why we have module exports. And the other one, we had export default. Um, but uh, essentially the same idea. We're exporting a function that takes um, a utility. Um, this, this one's called context. And we're going to be using context in the context of our plugin. Um, and the difference here is the what you're returning is the visitor object itself, um, whereas with the Babel plugin, it was an object that contained the visitor object, so an object that had a visitor property that was a visitor object. And so the, the same kind of pattern applies here. If we wanted to link something about identifiers, we'd say identifier, oops, capital I identifier, and then have a uh, function there. In our case, though, um, if we look at our AST, we can see that what we want to lint is the if statement, uh, because the if statement is the one that has a consequent. And so here, we'll just say, we'll copy this node type, and we'll uh, make that an if statement. Um, that if statement will get the node. If you remember it with the Babel plugin, it, had, it took the path that had a node. So there are a couple of nuances uh, about like the APIs for these things, but they serve totally different purposes. So Hopefully that um, that makes sense. And let's go ahead and console.log our node here just to make sure we're kind of going the right uh, right direction with things. So we have two nodes. That makes sense because we have two if statements. Uh, the first node is a of type if statement. It has a test, uh, which would be the something is greater than three. And it has a consequent, uh, just as we would expect. See, these have a test and a consequent. Um, and for this one, the uh, consequent is an expression statement. For our second one, the consequent is a block statement. And so what we can do is we could say if node.consequent is equal, or yeah, it's equal to block statement, oh, whoops, dot type. And we'll go ahead and return. Now we're only logging. Uh, one node, and that is the one that's breaking our rule. The consequent is not a box statement, it's an expression statement. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to use the context variable up here to 
report that this is a problem. And um, there are a couple of things that you absolutely must have with your report. You must have the node. And uh, that's actually that's everything we um, technically to get a report. But this is not a very helpful report. We know that something's wrong, but we don't know what it is. And so we're going to also provide a message. Oh, why you no block? And then we get our message right there. And if we were to like actually create this as a uh, plugin for ESLint and use it in our editor, um, if our editor was like configured to use ESLint, then we'd see this in line. Um, and it would be super awesome. Um, there's another really cool thing that you can do with this, and that is uh, you can provide a fix function. Uh, this utility called a fixer um, uh, helps stuff. So the, the fixer is a utility that basically helps you uh, transform the AST to fix the problem. And so this actually would be fairly simple for us, but I'm not, I'm not going to uh, delve into it. Uh, but basically, we just need to transform uh, this if statement uh, to have a consequent that's a block statement, rather. Uh, and then that block just contains the expression statement. Um, I believe this actually, uh, this entire rule, as well as a fixer, um, I believe, is implemented um, in ESLint already. So we're not going to be open sourcing this because it already exists. But hopefully, it uh, gives you an idea of uh, how the ESLint API works. And really, how simple uh, this um, like writing a plugin is. So just to kind of review, um, for an ESLint plugin, you simply export a function that takes a context, which you'll use to report the issues. Um, and that returns an object has, uh, that uses the visitor pattern. And this uh, each property being the node type that you want to visit. So in our case, we want to visit all if statements. And it will give us the node that we're interested in. And then here, we can um, actually just to, uh, for fun, I'm going to say, haha, not using a block statement in my ESLint rule. That's bad. Um, but uh, yeah, just kidding. Uh, so we're, uh, we're basically checking, does the node consequent have a type that is block statement? If it does, then it's just fine. It's not breaking this rule. So continue on to the next node. If it doesn't, then we're going to use the context object to report that um, it's breaking a rule. We'll pass the node that um, has the problem and uh, the message that we want to have shown. And, and the message can be dynamic. We can you know, do whatever we want based off of the node. Um, so we could actually turn this into a template literal. And uh, uh, let's see, yo, uh, why do you? I use a node dot consequent dot type instead of a here we go. So why do you use an expression instead of a uh, expression statement instead of a block? So that's kind of handy. And then we can also provide a fixer uh, to help fix um, fix things up. And so actually, the way that that is used by the the user of our plugin, uh, they would on the command line they'd say eslint. Um, my source directory, um, and then they would configure to be using your plugin. They'd just add dash dash fix, and it would go ahead and apply all the transforms um, to automatically fix all the problems um, that can be fixed. So that is ESLint. Um, and yeah, I, I'm, like I said, I'm sorry I don't have a, a JS code shift example. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I do still have like 20 minutes. Is that right? Um, Fernando, do I still have 20 minutes left? Or what time is this supposed to be over? No, no, correct. You have as much time as you need. OK, cool. So I'll just show a coach, uh, JS code shift um, uh, code mod. Um, I, uh, I have yet to successfully create one of these. Um, but uh, let's see, JS code mod. If we go to transforms, um, arrow function. So this is, let's bump this up. This code mod, um, if I understand the naming correctly, is responsible for taking a function and transforming it into an arrow function. So the it's a wildly different API from what you've seen before. Uh, actually, here, let's, let's do novars instead. That one might be a little bit easier. Oh, just kidding. It's huge. Uh, but basically, the idea is, 
um, you have you export a function that takes a file and uh, has an API that has a uh, JS code shift property on it. That's pretty much what all uh, uh, JS code shift code mods uh, use is this JS code shift, and they always pretty much always call it uh, J. And then you can um, take the source from the file, wrap it in J, and this gives you kind of like a, uh, they say it's a jQuery-like API. Um, and so um, we wrap it in this, and then we get this root object uh, that uh, we can uh, all find on it, and we can find variable declarations, and then we filter those uh, for the ones that are of kind var. So here we're, we're transforming all vars to let, um, presumably or const, it looks like they do that here. Uh, so th we filter all those to only do the vars, and then we filter those um, to do a whole bunch of other stuff. And yeah, at the end of ev when everything's all said and done, uh, then we uh, return the source if stuff was updated. So that's basically like the general idea of, uh, of code mods. Um, there, are, I do have a resource at the end uh, to kind of show you um, how to get started writing code mods. Um, but it's super cool, super practical, and one day I will be smart enough to um, to write one. Um, yeah, so I think that uh, I think that's it. Here's a, a bunch of resources that um, hopefully is really helpful. Uh, some stuff about the code mods that I was talking about, um, and that the Bible plugin handbook is really useful. And also. Um, uh, as as you saw, there are a bunch of different parsers that you can use um, for your like transformations and stuff. Um, and so there's a specification for uh, the AST nodes uh, that result from these different parsers. They're all a little bit different, and so they're kind of conforming on on a specification. So you can check out that also. And uh, yeah, that's it for me. Um, and I am happy to take any questions. Um, I, I should actually also ask if you could go to this URL. It'll take you to a Google form that takes like 60 seconds to fill out. I would really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, that's that. So I am happy to take your questions now. Uh, perfect. Ken, it looks like you did such an amazing job presenting that currently everybody understood. And I have actually, yeah, it looks like nobody got lost during your presentation, which is always plus. Yeah, plus. that's good. <laughs> Um, yeah, man, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Kenty Dodds, ACT, AST expert. Um, as always, don't forget these links. These videos are up on YouTube. So if you want, you can use the same link as always just to refresh it. So if you want to rewatch it or get a better look at his resources, just take a look. Um, Kent, as always, much appreciated, man. I know it was very early, bright and early for you. So much of Europe is much appreciated. And yeah, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, you can just let me know, and I can easily forward them to Kent. And with that, uh, have a good day, folks, or wherever part you're at. Cheers. <laughs> Bye.